Welcome back to the Future of DeFi Fireside Chat series. The following is a conversation with Jeremy Allaire, CEO and founder at Circle. Circle is the creator of USDC, one of the largest US dollar fully baked stablecoins, with almost 42 billion USDC in circulation. As a successful entrepreneur, Jeremy had his first IPO at age 28 in the dot-com era. In this conversation, Jeremy shares with us his conviction for blockchain and how it led to Circle, his thoughts on the necessity of DeFi regulation, his views on the relationship between central bank digital currency, CBDC, and non-government operated stable coins, and his valuable insights for entrepreneurs. Here is our conversation with Jeremy Allaire. Uh, hi, Jeremy. Thanks a lot for joining us. You are a very <laughs> great. So you are a very successful serial entrepreneur and had your first IPO at the age of 28, if I'm not mistaken, and during the dot-com era. Uh, and you started Circle to bring Bitcoin and blockchain to the mainstream. And now Circle is best known for developing stablecoin USDC. And congratulations. Now there's over 33 billion USDC uh, minted. So you have an amazing track record of spotting pivotal moments in internet history early on. Can you tell us a little bit, how do you identify the big transformations in industry and across industries early on? And what made you decide to work on bringing blockchain and crypto to the mainstream? Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to chat about, about all that. Part of my um, sort of seeing things early is, is really just, um, I think just trying to identify uh, the synthesis of um, what I think are, are kind of societal um, desires um, with you know, te technologies that where there are multiple overlapping technologies that are kind of compounding each other. And it's, I think, very common for people to be, maybe be focused on, on one particular piece of technology and sort of think about its capabilities. Um, and each of the technologies themselves might be on an adoption curve, but you really have to look at a whole bunch of technologies happening kind of all at once and look at each of their curves. And then you sort of see the exponential impact and you can kind of see out a little bit um, what might become possible. So, you know, in, in you know, 1993, 1994, when I was getting very involved in the commercialization of the internet, and the, the sort of d early development of, of infrastructure around the web, um, you know, I think the, the concept that I had back then, just for example, was that the web would become an application platform, that software, like almost all forms of software, right, could, could be distributed um, through browsers and that would, like change the ability of, of organizations and people to deliver interactive applications and services to everyone around the world. And that, that would kind of create this incredible growth in, in online applications. And, you know, the first web browser was around, it was very limited in what it could do. Um, but there were a number of things that, that were happening. So you had um, the advent of the web browser. And you could imagine, because there were people talking about it, right? Technologists were talking about it, that this would become better. You could have better graphics. You could um, have more ability to collect information from people. You could add security to it. Like you could see enough of the pieces that you could imagine, you know, a few years later, that at least the, the, that some of those capabilities were there. But it was the overlapping trends, which was, The, the rapid growth of internet service providers, people who could connect people to, to networks. The PC revolution was really starting to take hold. Desktop computers were actually starting to go much, much broader outside of the workplace. You know, Windows 95, as maybe people remember, um, was like a breakthrough in, in usable personal computers. And you could sort of see connectivity, um, web software, um, you know, uh, th th things like PCs, but also, you know, server, running a server, which used to be really hard for most people. They'd have to do Unix system administration. 
It was more specialized. Um, you know, Microsoft was making it popular to create a Windows server. And you kind of, again, you look at all these things together, you can see, actually, you know what? This is going to be something that anyone's going to be able to do. And there are eventually going to be hundreds of millions of people in the next few years connected to it. And that gave birth to the idea of, you know, building application platforms for, for the web. So that was like an early example. And, you know, you see that in, in, in other areas, whether it be communications, media distribution, television distribution, other things that have happened on the internet. And I think um, that, you know, that synthesis is, is really, really key. And with, um, you know, with crypto and with, with digital currency, I mean, the, the, there are a lot of different pieces, some of it very informed by um, the kind of broader macro landscape of what was happening with the international financial system. Um, what were very clearly um, risks that existed in the financial system and a desire to kind of improve it. Um, but, you know, you, you early on, you could sort of see, you know, blockchains like Bitcoin back in 2012, 2013, and, and really still today had very limited transaction throughput. Um, but you could imagine how the, you know, iterations on this could allow for much higher throughput. Um, you know, the idea that you could um, not just have the Bitcoin token, but that you could use the same record keeping system, the same security assurances and issue other tokens uh, on, on top of it. And that eventually you'd have a virtual machine you could write code in and deploy it onto these um, networks. And you could sort of see how these things would happen and you could sort of see, okay, maybe in three years, four years, five years, all those things will be in place. And if you have that, well, then it'll be possible to build like a protocol for something like dollars on the internet. And so it's a lot of times just imagining the arc of each of these things, um, where they sit in you know, sort of the, the, the desires of, of society and, um, and, and then just getting a lot of conviction around it. Um, and, and usually, you know, early on, um, it looks absurd um, to most people. Um, you know, I think that's what entrepreneurs do is take risks. But it looks absurd. It's sort of like, that's insane, right? That's not going to happen. How, how could that happen? And that's actually, a, I think, oftentimes a really good sign because it means that you're going to be so far ahead of other people um, in, in, get, in getting some of these things built. But there's a timing challenge, too. You can be too early. Um, you know, the people building the Symbian operating system, um, for example, they were just too early. In, in, in ultimately competing for, say, smartphone operating systems. So you can be too early. You can also obviously be too late. And, uh, you know, I think um, Circle as a company is an example where we were too early on some things. Um, and, and we've had interesting timing in different areas. Um, and then eventually you kind of, you know, find your, find your groove um, and can kind of build from that. Yeah, thanks a lot. So that's uh, uh, right, really uh, seeing how, like you said, not just one uh, technological transformation, but multiple uh, this technological innovation and trends coming together. Um, that's amazing. And you touch on the timing question. I think that's a really good question and a really good point. I think many students here are also entrepreneurial. And uh, timing is a very important aspect, of course, for a venture. So could you elaborate a little bit more on that? On one hand, yes, you want to spot these trends early and the possibilities brought by these new transformations. But on the other hand, yes, like you said, one can also be too early. And Circle was started in 2013, right? Uh, and I think uh, Circle also has gone through uh, different uh, transformation uh, changes also. So yeah, could you elaborate on that? How should one really think about the timing question? It's hard to perfectly time things, right? I, I think um, entrepreneurs, um, it's important to have really deep conviction um, and really, really strong passion um, for something. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I've, I've met a lot of people who are creating a startup because they want to create a startup, right? It's like, it's the thing to do. And then they say, what's the problem that we could go solve? And let's get a couple of friends together. We'll go figure out something to go solve. Um, and that can work out for sure. But I think like, really enduring companies 
you know, come from people who have a lot of deep conviction about solving a problem and can see, you know, have a vision for a better future, right? And, and it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to send uh, people to Mars, if you're trying to build uh, self-flying air taxis, if it, whatever you're trying to do, right? Um, if you're trying to reinvent the global financial system. Um, but you have to have like a, a strong conviction and a vision for what's possible. And that, that vision for what's possible should obviously be backed up by, you know, if it's a technology driven business, like a good understanding of what the technical possibilities, right? Um, and, and then I think, you know, the, the, the timing, you know, my experience has been at least that it takes a long time to do anything significant. The, the, the things that happen like super fast, like, you know, uh, Insta, Insta, Instagram, Instagram. Yeah, that was like a great example. It was six people. They got it going and went viral. Just like, holy cow, right? That's by far the exception, right? Almost everything takes a long time. And I think if you have the perspective of, you know, it probably will take about 10 years to actually realize, you know, even the first major pieces of a vision, that's actually a, a sane thought. Um, so I think from a, just a timing perspective, I think people should look at, at, at thinking about committing themselves to like eight to 10 years. Um, and I think that's, I just, I think that's what it takes to do something significant and to actually everything I've worked on, the big ideas, it really took about 10 years. And, and I remember other great companies like Netflix, you know, who Reed, Reed Hastings had a great vision for what online video could be, but it just wasn't technically possible at the time. So he, he thought, okay, why don't we get the behavior changing? How do we get the behavior changing? We get the behavior changing by making it easy to actually select videos online, have a big catalog online and make the, the delivery of the video easier, even though it was basically still physical discs. But he was clearly, he could see the mountaintop, right? He could see the mountaintop he was climbing towards. He didn't know exactly the path that would get there. He had faith that broadband would come. He had faith that connected televisions would happen because that was obvious that they would, but he didn't know exactly when. And so I, I think with um, a lot of ventures, um, it's, you know, entering into it with, with an understanding that you're very likely going to try a lot of things. Um, you're going to have to iterate and learn. Pivots are, are good. I, I like the metaphor of mountain climbing as well, because when you see the mountain from a distance, you can see the top, it's beautiful, but you have no idea what the path is gonna be and you will have to pivot. You're gonna run against a cliff and you're gonna say, oh shit, we just hit a cliff. We gotta go back down, now we can go back up. Um, so like that's very much what startups and growing companies is like. It's never a straight line. It never goes like, exactly as you plan. Markets change, technology changes, you're adapting all the time, um, but it's patience and having that strong conviction over the long run that I think is, is really important. So speaking of conviction and vision, can you then uh, share a little bit about when you started circling in 2013, why, what was your conviction and why did you have that conviction and, and the vision and how has that changed now over now it's been eight years? What's always drawn me to the internet um, from really when I started getting involved with it in 1990 um, was my excitement about the idea that there was an open global permissionless network um, that was always a, the profound thing that 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 i saw so when i was in college and i was able to like connect my pc to the internet i was very lucky to be able to do that in 1990 and 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 i and i and i realized that there were protocols there was the ftp protocol and there was the email protocols and there were um, you know, gopher protocol, which was a really early protocol, but there were these protocols that were basically just software libraries. And then any computer that had those software libraries could connect and could then directly interact and directly share information. It was so revolutionary. Um, and it was a, it was an open network, this idea of an open internet, an open network that really the only thing you need is, is a piece of software that, that can speak a common language, so to speak. Um, that was really profound. And I think, you know, 
that pattern has repeated itself over and over and over again in different forms of protocols that have you know widened the utility of the internet. And I think you know my, my own interest. Um, so I have this sort of I, I call myself an internet maximalist. Um, so I I am like an internet maximalist, and I think um, you know this the sort of DNA and these patterns again they they keep repeating themselves. What drew me to this project um, was um, an additional interest of mine, which is I've always had the belief that you know the internet has the opportunity to kind of bring the world more close together, to connect the world more closely. That it's not just about connecting people with information, but actually economic activity, and that that could actually lead to a, a, like a, a, a less um, a world with less conflict and um, and 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 more you know rising of, of prosperity for people. That's always been a belief of mine, and that even the internet itself could challenge political structures like nation states and, and create new kinds of, of of governance structures. So I've always believed this, and um, I think uh, my 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 background is not in computer science. I don't have a technical background. Everything I know technically is self taught, and. Um, I, I actually studied, you know, political science, philosophy, economics, um, and was, you know, constantly interested in how does the world work? What are the power structures of the world? How does the international macro economic system work? Those were like interests of mine. And then I was like distracted by building technology businesses, but they were always aligned with this idea that um, there was this was kind of building a new international or new global infrastructure that was important for how the world could come together. And uh, I think after the financial crisis, um, you know, I became much more interested again in global political economy, right? So I was very interested in the history of money, the, you know, the, the international monetary system, central banking. I was just became much more interested in it and again, and it refreshed some of my historical interests. And so while I was running an online video technology company and it was taking that company public, um, I then kind of stumbled into Bitcoin um, in, in 2012, um, you know, just exposed to it through my just reading uh, on the Internet and um, it very quickly caught my uh, attention. And I think it was a synthesis of so many of these themes. It was the synthesis of, uh, you know, open protocols, uh, you know, the the shifts that were happening in, in the nature of money, um, the economic system and and very, you know, as I dived in and started reading more and not just reading, you know, Satoshi's white paper, but actually reading and the, the conversations that were happening amongst early technologists that were thinking about this problem, it became really clear to me that this was kind of the kernel uh, of a new infrastructure layer for the internet. And that th this was an infrastructure layer that was going to solve, had the potential to solve um, economic coordination um, and, 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 you know, representation of value, the exchange of value um, on the internet. It was like a missing layer of the internet. Um, and the fact that it was built on that common DNA, open, decentralized, permissionless, um, just told me that it was the it was, it was sort of on the right path. Um, and because I think all of these, you know, global scale things that happen on the internet happen in that architecture. So I became obsessed, basically, I became obsessed with it. And, um, and then, you know, t tying to the other other question you, you asked me, which is, what did I see? Well, as a technologist, I was, you know, I, I was seeing people come up with ideas for how you could leverage the public chain to um, issue other data structures uh, on top of it. And I was seeing people proposing ways to extend the script language of, of, of Bitcoin to create Turing complete virtual machines. And I was seeing people coming up with proposals for faster block times. And these were like ideas bouncing around. Um, but it was clear to me and my co-founder as well, Sean, that those things were going to happen, right? Those things would happen. Um, and 
you know, we, we actually thought they would happen on Bitcoin. We thought Bitcoin had first mover advantage. Um, it had a vibrant developer community. Um, it ended up being an extraordinarily closed developer community, very hostile to other developers participating. Um, it was tightly, tightly controlled. And, um, and so it was not a, a community that, that really allowed much developer um, activity. And so I think a lot of, a lot of um, technologists got very frustrated. I mean, Vitalik Buterin was kind of cast, you know, sort of shunned from the Bitcoin developer community, from the core dev community. And he had a lot of great ideas. Um, and so he said, okay, well, I, I want to take these ideas forward. I'm going to do a clean room, you know, um, uh, implementation. And so we were wrong actually about Bitcoin being the, the core technology. Um, but I think we were right about the kind of time frame it would take to see the second generation of this mature, which we thought it would take, you know, three to five years. But when we founded the company, we sort of said, okay, those things will become possible. If those things become possible, then it'll be, it will be possible to create what we called an HTTP of money. Um, that you could create a protocol where you could represent, you know, traditional money like dollars as a digital currency, and then you could transact them like you, you can transact or exchange data with HTTP. So we kind of had this idea and we knew that that would eventually arrive. And we just said, okay, well, let's start working towards this now. Um, and, and, and again, we, we went into it with the thought that maybe this would emerge on top of Bitcoin. We tried to actually, we, the first product we built actually essentially tried to build a, 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 a user experience where you could take dollars and you could use Bitcoin as a transmission network. And we had a real, real time kind of fiat crypto liquidity engine so that you could spend dollars from a traditional payment instrument directly over the Bitcoin network to, to, to an address. And it was actually a beautiful user experience. We had to build a lot of infrastructure to make that possible. Um, but anyway, that was one of the big ideas. You'd be able to have a protocol that made it possible to do sort of, you know, dollars on the internet that these platforms would allow for programmability. The idea of programmable money was a super powerful idea. And I think our conclusion was if you have, you know, money as a native data type on the internet and you have programmability around that, and that programmability can be executed by sort of autonomous machines on the internet or what people call smart contracts that you could actually really imagine um, kind of reinventing how savings, lending, um, capital formation, capital allocation, and, and the time value of money, these building blocks of finance, you could imagine how those could move to that infrastructure. And, and our belief was that maybe it would take five to 10 years for a standard for some for for like a protocol for dollars on the internet to work probably take another 10 years for you know those other forms of how the financial system works the allocation of capital the time value of money that these things would take longer it's been interesting cuz you know defi has has you know really started you know seriously in like 2018 um, and so that that in some ways came earlier than we thought um, and now it's accelerating really fast. And, and, then, and then these things kind of feed on each other, obviously. Looking at uh, what's happening in DeFi now and comparing to your conviction, your vision back then and your thoughts now, uh, maybe can you also talk a little bit then um, what aspects of DeFi are particularly important to you and uh, why? There were like um, a couple of, I think, really um, it, it, things that, that we've been excited about, um, and we're starting to see some of this mature. I mean, I, I think one was that essentially, um, you know, the, the, the concept of a capital market, um, could, could move to be executed on chain. And, um, you know, the, the, there's a bigger idea, which, uh, I've talked about for years, which is the idea of long tail capital markets. And, you know, lo long tail, the concept of the long tail has been a concept in the internet space for a long time. It originally kind of came about with like online media. But the idea is that, you know, these, the internet's really great at convening multi sided markets. And a lot of those have been basically through centralized multi sided markets. Um, eBay being the first classic example, 
but you know, massive multi-sided markets like AdWords and 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 and, and Google's um, you know advertising platform or YouTube or so many others, and that kind of that multi-sided platform model where you have the reach of the internet um, and the openness of a open marketplace of, of whatever problem it's solving um, allows for like long tail markets to exist. And so in advertising before you had, you know, auction marketplaces and online advertising platforms like Google, it was really inconceivable that a small business could do super, super targeted advertising to, find exactly the customer that they wanted from anywhere in the world. It was just, in, it was just impossible, right? So the long tail made it possible for even the smallest individual to kind of more fairly participate in those, those, uh, those kinds of value exchange. And, you know, Alibaba and, and, uh, and Amazon are like these long tail, you know, um, markets for products, right? I can create a product in any country in the world and I can, you know, find a distribution path to any consumer in the world. Um, and, and this is all done through these like long tail markets. And that's really amazing. It's changed so many industries. So the idea is, you know, will crypto and blockchains allow for long tail capital markets? And the, I think that the answer is very clearly yes. Um, and that's a really profound concept because I think it, it gets to this idea that any entity, whether it's an individual or a firm, will be able to source capital, uh, be able to, you know, whether that's through raising capital or, or selling what is like what we think of as a security, like a future obligation. Um, households will be able to take things that they have and, and get capital against those. Or, you know, a, a long tail capital market would also have you know, the ability to use, you know, risk and, and reputational data and identity data and other things to very, very efficiently price risk. But those things could be done entirely online. Um, and in the, in the blockchain world, that those can be done entirely by market structures that, that exist just in code on the internet. So it's even more profound. And this decentralization, decentralization Web3 model, right, will apply to other markets, not just financial markets, but that idea is, is really significant, this idea of long tail capital markets. And um, I think, um, you know, you're seeing versions of that today. Um, I think things like the, the Uniswap um, model uh, and, and this idea of, you know, automated market makers and these liquidity pools where even a token that is super illiquid that in and of itself, it would be very, very hard to establish a market. Actually, there is a, a, an incentive mechanism to create liquidity um, that's specific to a super, super niche, um, you know, thing. That's like a pretty profound innovation. It's evidence to me that long tail capital markets are emerging. Now, it still needs to really connect out to, you know, the real world more, right? So. A, a lot of the tokens are like tokens and other protocols. And it's sort of this recursive loop of I, I, I'm trading protocol tokens using protocols with tokens to generate, you know, uh, elaborate forms of incentivized yield. Like that's that that is that's sort of detached a little bit from the real world economy. So I think the thing that we're excited about is how do, um, you know, real world entities, individuals, households, firms, connect to these and you know both provide and access capital um, from them on a global decentralized market infrastructure so i think we're we're still a ways away from that but i think you know we're seeing evidence through through innovations in on-chain capital market structures uh, of that similarly you know i think we have always imagined that borrowing and lending behaviors um, for even individuals or firms um, where, where the borrowing and lending decisions, um, you know, could, could involve not just, um, you know, people who are, you know, over collateralizing a, 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 a borrow with, uh, with something like a, a Bitcoin or, or, or over collateralizing kind of margin trading type borrowing, which is, I think, almost all the borrowing that exists today. Now that's, that's sort of interesting from a financialization perspective, 
But I think it, it's much more interesting if a, a household or a firm can show up in a market and there's a way for enough data to be available to that on-chain market that people can underwrite risk and take risk and insure risk and allow people to do unsecured lending and allow people to you know, b borrow capital that they don't have collateral against, which is a huge, huge part of what a capital market provides to the real economy. And so I think there are experiments in that, for example, that are happening today. They're fairly nascent and small, but I think those are things that we're, we're quite interested in um, because I think they, they really advance this idea of an open internet capital market that can serve real economic, uh, you know, purposes. I mean, this is certainly, certainly DeFi is, um, at the very early stage, right? If we look at the, the traditional financial uh, capabilities and markets. Uh, so as, as you said, right, there's not, there are not significant on-chain leverage platforms that allow you to do like 100x or, or 10x, um, leverage. Um, But DeFi is also innovating uh, beyond the capabilities of TradFi or traditional finance, for example, with flash loans, um, while still learning and mirror, mirroring TradFi in a sense. So when do you think will we experience the moment where TradFi will start mirroring concepts from DeFi? I'm much more interested in, in, in you know, just DeFi just continuing to grow <laughs> as opposed to TradFi uh, emulating DeFi. Um, Uh, but um, I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we, we talk about Circle as, you know, we're trying to build a, a global digital currency bank. We're trying to build a commercially focused entity. So we're not facing consumers, we're facing businesses and, 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 and things like that. And, you know, businesses need to, um, you know, need to borrow capital all the time. Um, they, this is the real world need. I want to hire employees. I want to build a factory. I want to start a company. I want to access capital um, to grow. And, you know, today that takes place, um, you know, through fractional reserve banking. It takes place through unsecured lending. Um, and, you know, there's at, at the one extreme, it's venture capital or venture debt. At another, it's, you know, you have an existing business and a bank is, is looking at your cash flows and, your assets and saying, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give you a loan, um, you know, on, on these terms. And uh, as long as you bank with us, right. Um, or things like that. And I think, um, so I'm really interested in seeing the, the guts of, of commercial finance um, moving entirely to DeFi infrastructure. Um, and I, I think that's quite possible. And I think it's going to be a far superior model of 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 both capital formation and and lending and borrowing i think it's just going to be far superior to what what banks do today um and i think it's possible to do on a full reserve digital currency as well and this gets to your comment about things like flash loans which is what if i have you know i mean the, all of this is around is sort of constructs around the time value of money right so i, I have capital I don't need it right now. I'm willing to let other people use it for a period of time if they pay me for that use. I mean, that's the, the most simplistic definition of, of, of that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, central banks um, and, and commercial banking is built on a fractional reserve lending model in part because of the inefficiencies of storing and moving value. Um, and, I think in a world where all value is in, is instantly and immediately connected to all other nodes and where even f tiny fractions of value can be made available and utilized at virtually no cost and contractually locked in different ways, um, that it's actually going to be possible to have um, what are what look like demand deposit accounts, i.e. I have a pool of money that I effectively can get at uh, anytime I want. And for the underlying, that underlying money to be really broadly utilized by the real economy in different ways. And, you know, flash loans are a really interesting example of that. It's like, you know, someone needs a, a borrow for a short, for bursts of time. And you can imagine that at a massive scale, you know, matching, matching, you know, different needs on a, on a, on a full reserve, you know, base of capital. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited about things like that. 
um, that could that could uh, really change um, you know what what's possible with lending, but do it in a safer way. Do it in a way that's you know uh, more resilient, that's safer, that doesn't involve you know money creation in in quite the same way. Um, and and that sort of these sound money principles that are I think inherent in the crypto world, they're implicit in some ways in the architecture of crypto, you know, can be at least, um, I think are important and, and important to kind of carry through the future of DeFi as well. When you mean um, safer lending, are you referring to like less risks of liquidation or what specifically? I mean, obviously, uh, liquidation risks are always going to exist if, if someone is borrowing and they don't, you know, they don't have collateral uh, against that. So um, I, I do believe that Uh, you know, we, we see this today in online lending, the growth of things like buy now, pay later are, are indicative really of basically machine learning, being able to make decisions, make risk decisions much, much more efficiently than a bank, uh, you know, traditional credit risk model. Right. And so you're, you're seeing, you know, the, the scale of data that's available around an entity, an online entity, like a person um, enabling, you know, mach you know, AI to effectively make these risk decisions much more easily. If you could bring, um, you know, essentially richer and richer data to on-chain markets, um, then I actually think just from an underwriting perspective, I think that you'll be able to have, you know, uh, incentivized underwriting that's happening by market participants who are incentivized to underwrite as effectively as possible. Um, I think that that can actually, that can lower risk, right? Um, and, and so it's sort of distributing out the underwriting model um, in, in, into, into market structures, but you need to have more information connected in, into those to, to make that work. Um, but I think that, that that is possible. I think the other part of the safer is, um, you know, a, you know, The, the sort of money creation process of you have a, you know, a, a base of say a million dollars in deposits, and then you, you know, create $10 million of loans from that inherently means there is this money creation happening uh, in the economy. The, the fractional reserve component of that is, does, in create, does in fact create an implicit risk. And, If it's possible to not actually have money creation happen, but just to have more efficient ways to lock that base capital and utilize that base capital, um, that would actually make the underlying financial system safer. It's really beautiful how you how you convey that uh, this the access to the information will make the system safer, as so well the distributed nature will make it safer. Um, and you you, er you earlier mentioned that uh, you hope that DeFi will take over everything. Um, I, I I actually had planned to ask you um, what will be done by DeFi, what will be done by CFI in, in the financial market, but you really believe everything will be captured by DeFi or mostly? There are constraints, right? Um, uh, the physics of blockchains um, are a very real constraint, right? Nanosecond level market uh, decisions that are made on like centralized infrastructure, right? Um, you know, the most advanced electronic markets in the world are, are operating at that nanosecond kind of performance, right? The ability to have shared consensus of state in nanoseconds on a blockchain, it's just inconceivable in some ways right now. I, I, I don't know, you know, is that a quantum computing thing? I don't, I don't know. Maybe you need quantum crypto to, 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 to get there. So right now, you know, the, the you know, I think, you know, Blockchains like Solana uh, have demonstrated a, without sharding, an ability to, you know, get to settlement finality. Um, and effectively, that's the, the speed with which information can travel on a blockchain in like 350 milliseconds or 400 milliseconds. And I think, you know, if you talk to people in the space, you know, there's a belief that maybe over the next several years that could come down to like 80 milliseconds, but it's still, that's pretty good. You know, that's like, uh, I, I think that's like the, 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 the speed of light on fiber or something like that. And so, you know, that, that's, that then becomes the, the, the speed with which 
market signals and data can can be seen by everyone. Um, and so that will definitely allow for, um, you know, taking on more and more types of, 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 of market decisions and risk decisions and other things, but there are going to be certain things that just can't, can't be done uh, on, on a blockchain. Um, so you, you could have a synthesis of sort of off-chain compute, off-chain transactions and on-chain kind of, um, you know, finality uh, that can also be an architecture that, that people use. Now let's move on to talk a little bit more about USDC. And so a reserve-backed stablecoin is a very new subject and very few lawyers and regulators are familiar with such new concepts and technologies and so on. So can you share uh, a little bit how you started and developed and scaled a reserve-backed stablecoin, USDC? Some of this obviously relates to, to things that I talked about earlier, which was we were always interested in this idea of a protocol for dollars on the internet, a sort of HTTP for money. And in um, late 2016, um, you know, Ethereum had reached a point where um, it was like production beta. Uh, you could actually start to build things on it. And um, we actually sort of said, okay, we can now build something like this. Um, so we began, um, and we actually publicly talked about starting an open source project at the time we called it Spark. That was the code name. And we, we made a couple of blog posts about it. Um, and we basically said, we're, we're moving away from using Bitcoin as a, as a payment and settlement infrastructure. And we're going to work, we're going to move to Ethereum and we're going to work on a new open source project to enable fiat currency tokens, um, on, on, uh, on Ethereum. And, you know, we didn't talk much about it. People didn't really pay much attention. Um, but that was actually the, the, the early, the, the early work that began on what eventually became USDC. Now, when w we worked on the, the technology and frankly, you know, there were certain, you know, releases of Ethereum and upgrades to Ethereum that were kind of necessary to, to make it work. But for the most part, the, the smart contract piece and the token piece was actually the simplest part of it. Um, and if you actually go look at GitHub or you just go look on chain at the source code for the USDC smart contract, it's super simple, right? That's, that's not the hard part. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, and actually the simpler, the better, because it, it needs, you know, you want to have as few, um, you know, opportunities in terms of the attack surface, uh, for, for a monetary system. Right. Um, so, you know, we, 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 um, we had built out a lot of capabilities as a company around, um, getting licensed as a company that could basically sit between the existing banking system and virtual currency, as it was largely called back then. And we had gotten licensed throughout the United States and had the first bit license in, in New York. And we built out a lot of the fundamental infrastructure, the banking partnerships with like leading banks um, and, and, and different types of relationships to the card networks. We had built out risk engines, compliance engines, a lot of these things that we had built up for other products. And we basically said, hey, what, what if we, you know, express all of that capability um, and connect all that capability to, um, you know, to a fiat token um, protocol? Um, and and you know, this is before people had the word stable coins. Um, so we, 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 the, white, the white paper for, for USDC, which was the center.io uh, center white paper, we would talk about fiat tokens. We're going to have these different fiat tokens and fiat token protocols. And, but, um, you know, we, um, you know, we, we, we wanted to build something that, um, was, you know, based in a legal and regulatory framework. Um, we wanted to actually have something that was, um, you know, issued under a regulatory framework and that therefore was something that, um, you know, people could trust more. Um, and, you know, the, 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 you know, there was a lot of discussion around crypto collateralized stable coins, um, back in, in 2018 as well. And, and we could talk about that as a topic, because I think it's a really important topic. And I think over in the future, I mean, already it's growing and it will grow for sure. But, um, our view is that there's a huge opportunity to connect the, you know, existing financial system to this new blockchain financial system. 
And we wanted to kind of build a hybrid model that could, you know, take advantage of, um, you know, real dollar assets and, you know, use those to back a digital currency unit um, and do it under a regulatory framework. Um, that's the same regulatory framework that is the basis for your PayPal balance or your Square balance. So it's the electronic stored value money transmission law in the United States. So we're able to build a product with a regulatory framework around it and have it issued by a regulated financial institution, which was Circle, and but release it as sort of an open protocol that could run on a public blockchain so that anyone could transact with it and anyone could connect to it and use it. Um, and, you know, we really tried to set a, a high bar for compliance, um, regulatory, um, and, you know, being based in the U.S. with U.S.-based banking, um, with, you know, major global public accounting firm that was auditing not just Circle, but also examining the reserves and their backing and, and attesting to that every month. Um, and we wanted to build something that was sort of could, could be not just more trusted, but actually was treated more like a standard people could build around. And that was actually liquid, right, that you could easily create and redeem. And so we, we, you know, we brought in Coinbase as a partner to help launch this. That was a great partnership. It is a great partnership. And I think, um, you know, created a way for the average retail person through Coinbase or an institution through Circle to very easily create and redeem at par, at no cost with like high quality banking system integration. And that was really important. So all those things, I think, were the basis for a product that the market was really interested in. And, and then in you know, 2018, as DeFi projects were getting started in 2019, as more and more exchanges and wallets and DeFi protocols were developing, you know, USDC became kind of a go-to um, trusted you know, stablecoin. And um, we saw the product market fit was very strong. And, um, and it was achieving early network effects. And so you know, we decided to like put a huge uh, amount of investment behind growing that, growing the ecosystem, building up more products and services around it. Um, and you know, that, that has you know, been timed well with the overall growth in, in DeFi and, and digital assets. And so it's, 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 I think it's grown really fast. You know, the numbers, it grew 10x last year, it'll probably grow more than 10x this year. And um, I think um, it's a network effects business. Right. It's sort of like 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 with messaging apps, right? The more people who have the messaging app, the more valuable the messaging app becomes. And it sort of feeds on itself a little bit. USDC is going through a little bit of that right now uh, because just more and more people are using it. And because more people are using it, um, there's more demand for it. And then more people provide support for it. And, and so we've definitely seen that happen. Also, there has been a lot of discussions on central bank digital currency, CBDCs, uh, especially recently. So what do you think about CBDC and what do you think the relationship is uh, between CBDC and, um, and USDC? The way we look at this is um, through a few different kind of lenses. I think um, the first is just to kind of look at what electronic money is in the world today uh, before digital currency. Um, so, you know, there's a good, you know, almost, almost 70 years of, of electronic money history. It goes way back to the, you know, the, the first, you know, credit cards. Um, but eventually, you know, the, the international wire system, um, you know, the, the, the card networks themselves, what, what a lot of people would have thought of as electronic money, um, were, um, you know, developed principally. Uh, and operated by private companies. And, you know, most of the major innovations in electronic money have come from private companies um, or consortiums of private entities. SWIFT itself is a great example of that. The SWIFT electronic money messaging system is just a consortium of, of, of commercial firms agreeing to a set of technical standards for interoperability. Um, you know, the clearinghouse is a similar example in, in interbank, uh, you know, settlement. Uh, in the United States, at least. Um, and obviously the credit card networks the debit card networks, um, eventually things like PayPal and Apple Pay, you know, a lot of these things have all come from private sector innovation. And 95% of the electronic money in the world is issued by private companies today. Only 5% of electronic money is sort of the 
the records in the SQL database at the Federal Reserve. It's literally a SQL database. So I think, um, you know, we have to kind of look at that in perspective. And I think what we're now seeing is a combination of not just private sector innovation, but open internet innovation. This idea that there's a public infrastructure that we can build on and rely on. A lot of the things we talked about earlier, open, open internet uh, infrastructure, um, open source technologies, open compute platforms, which is what a blockchain is. The ability to synthesize that whole arc of open internet infrastructure with private sector innovation in digital currency is a very powerful force and I think will grow. And I think it has potential to grow very, very large. So if 95% of electronic money today is, is commercial bank electronic money, what I call ACH money, it's like a hundred trillion dollars plus. Um, we think that, um, you know, digital currency models, fiat digital currency models that operate on public infrastructure that are issued, um, you know, through, through, you know, private um, infrastructure, private sector uh, innovation could, could be a big piece of that in the future. Um, and I think, you know, that's like an innovation curve that's happening. And, and clearly, as it grows and becomes much more large, governments are going to regulate it more. They're going to sort of say, hey, these, these institutions that are doing this, they should be supervised like national banks. They have to have special security rules, special safety rules, uh, you know, capital reserve buffers, all this fun stuff, right? So, and, and we agree with that for what it's worth. Um, and at the same time, I think the, the, the rapid growth of, of digital currency, um, which, you know, relative to the existing financial system is still quite small, but it's growing so fast, has really gotten a lot of governments to say, holy cow, cryptographic money is real. Uh, there's a need um, for this kind of technology. And I think in some ways there's a belief that there always there needs to be a public option um, that, that you can't have a monetary system where there's no public option. And I think that's an important concept, right? Um, individ, you know, within within a sovereign, you know, model, um, the ability for someone to ultimately get the sovereign coin of the realm um, to have a a obligation directly with the government um, that they can hold that's not intermediated that's not created uh, by a, a private entity is is i think philosophically important um, and so my own view is most most governments are very very early in thinking about this um, and if you think about how long it will take to operationalize something um, for most governments it's many many years um, and, and especially for a country like the United States, many, many years uh, to, to do that. And so in the meantime, there's going to be all of this private sector innovation and it will grow. But eventually, um, could there be um, a, uh, you know, instead of, you know, the M1, which is, you know, the database records uh, in, a, in a Oracle database, uh, it, you know, instead you could have it in a, in a cryptographic form that's uh, on, on some form of crypto ledger uh, that is, is controlled by the government. Is that like a, a reasonable upgrade to that, uh, that, that in infrastructure? I think it is, right? That seems like a good infrastructure upgrade that should happen. Um, but I think um, the vast majority of digital currency in circulation is gonna come uh, from the private sector. You're speaking about regulations, right? How, um, how we need, um how we need uh, regulators to to convey trust um to, or to 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 secure customers um or that's that's likely one of the the main reasons why we have regulations right to protect customers from um from all kinds of um, mishaps that might happen um so regarding defi if you just look at uh, the current landscape um, or maybe the the next two three years because uh, I'm, i guess you have a, a little bit of a four four front view Uh, in that regard. Um, so to what degree do you think is DeFi either over or under-regulated at the moment? Well, DeFi is definitely not over-regulated right now. Um, there's, there's virtually no regulation on DeFi right now. Um, so I think um, it's complicated, right? Because there's never been a situation where 
um, the, the market infrastructure is performed by autonomous software uh, that exists in an immutable fashion, you know, I immutable autonomous software that's on the public internet. That's just, I mean, that's just like a big concept. Um, and that's never existed. So what does it mean to regulate DeFi? So I think you might be able to regulate how different types of intermediaries can interact with it. Um, you know, sort of regulate the use of the technology, not the technology itself, as some, as some people say. Um, I think, um, the, you know, th there are questions being raised now about, well, there are software developers and maybe the software developers, you regulate the software developers somehow. I think that's a very dangerous concept. Um, I think, you know, this is all fundamentally just math and free speech. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, we want to live in a society where you can't define what math is possible and you want to, you want to continue to have open, you know, free speech in the, in the form of code. So I think those are, those are, those are the realities. Um, and this was like, you know, in the early days of the internet, there was a lot of discussion about basically trying to regulate encryption, which is crypto, right? So there was early, a lot of big discussions about regulating crypto, public key cryptography, was becoming available and it's becoming commercially available. And the, the, the national security establishment said, this is weapons grade technology. This, we have to control this. We can't let it be exported. We have to control who can use it. But that didn't happen, right? And, and I think the idea that this was just math and free speech won. Um, and, you know, so I, I think, you know, it's challenging, but I think it's possible to have regulations around. You know, I think that um, households and firms are going to rely upon regulated financial intermediaries for 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 various forms of of conduct. And it's kind of like, yes, I can set up a mail server on my own machine and be a peer on the SMTP network. I have the ability to. I have the freedom to do that. But I just use Google Apps and Gmail because you know what? I don't want to worry about backup, security, storage. I don't want to. I don't want to worry about a lot of stuff. I want someone to be my custodian. I want someone to deal with the complexity of that. That's very much going to. I mean, that's sort of the case with crypto today, right? The vast majority uh, of, of, of users of crypto they they, they don't self custody it, right? They're terrified to self custody it because it's it's a terrifying thing to do. That will become easier and easier over time. Self custody will be easier, um, but I think that firms and households will want to depend on internet services um, to to deal with this. And I think that's where regulation will come. Um, I think you know Circle is a regulated financial intermediary. We are regulated in terms of a whole series of obligations around consumer protection, money laundering risk. And, and, and then over time, maybe more things as well. And so it's the kind of business conduct, the activity and the intermediaries where I think rules could, could, uh, could apply. Um, and it, it's, it's, um, you know, I think that's, that's very likely what we'll see more of. I, I think it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, you know, regulate the, the open source software itself. I mean, this is, I really like how you, how you tie together the, the freedom of speech, the openness of the financial system, um, and, and then the efficiency of it, um, but clarify how, how to remain kind of in a, in a regulated and, and trustworthy environment. You know, it could be that there's regulations that say, like, if you're an intermediary, that's going to, that's going to, you know, provide capital to or borrow capital from a DeFi market, that it may be that the regulation says, like, you know, you, there there are levels of audits, um, security audits, um, or uh, record keeping requirements, or other things that have to be in place to to be able to offer that as a financial service. Um, you know, there's operational uh, risks, there's security risks. Those are actually pretty deep risks from a consumer protection perspective. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. We see these rug pulls, uh, we see, uh, you know, um, smart contract uh, uh, hacks that result in hundreds of millions of dollars of theft and loss. Um, you know, in the existing traditional financial system, that's unacceptable. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there is self-regulation to some degree. There's sort of, you know, auditing standards that people say, hey, you need to go through this level of audit. There's these technical code auditing firms and so on. Um, but maybe there's more to do there um, around, around the, the practices that are involved in, in you know, um, providing a, a, a financial service to, to households and firms that are built around these things. Many of our students are actually uh, quite entrepreneurial. So they, they look up to um, serial entrepreneurs like yourself. Um, and you've, you've already shared quite important lessons, right? Uh, like such, such as having a deep conviction and being, being in there for the long run. Um, what other important leadership lessons and recommendations for early entrepreneurs uh, would you like to share with us? <laughs> There's a lot of lessons. Um, I, I think um, um, I think a lot of the lessons that I've learned have to do with people. Um, you know, most of most of what a business is is it's just about it's just about the people. You know, as I like to say, circles like. You know, it's 350 people with laptops. Like that's that's all we are. We're, we're, it's really the 350 people, and everything is is you know everything we own, everything we create, everything we do, everything we it's it's all just us and our laptops. But it's just us, and I think um, so much of what it is to be effective in in building things is about um, you know, it's about establishing, you know, really strong, you know, core values, establishing, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a culture that makes it a place where people feel welcome, ideas can be heard, um, where there's, you know, um, humility, you know, um, Yeah, it's just so so much of it just has to do with like what values you bring to the table and how you organize people around those and how you get you get things done. Um, so I think being very intentional about those things is really important. Um, I think so many times people they're basically you know it's kind of a means to the end uh, 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 or uh, the 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 end justifies the means. Just like we're just gonna you know. It's all about driving really hard or it's about, you know, take no prisoners or, you know, it's uh, a lot of these the these sort of attitudes that I think are destructive, um, burn people out, frustrate people. Um, but, you know, being very well you know grounded in values, I think having very clearly articulated, um, you know, and rolling objectives and measurable results very, very clear, small steps, what you're doing is really important. So everyone understands what they're trying to do. Um, those are important things. And, you know, I mean, there's some big, bigger, bigger lessons in terms of people. I mean, I think that the, the, the group of people that wants to join a startup from zero to say 50 people, um, you know, it's very likely that the vast majority of those people won't be around, uh, when you're 200 people. Or 300 people. Um, and I think there is a kind of, um, there are certain types of people that want to be involved at certain scales. And I think there, are, you know, a lot of times the people who you might have, um, they might be your friends. You may have started a company with a friend. I, I, I think that's fine, but you have to realize that, you know, at some point they're not going to be in the right job. <laughs> and um, and not everyone scales, not everyone knows how to operate at higher and higher levels. And so I think, you know, um, just being, you know, being aware of the limitations of people is also really important. Um, and that doesn't mean that people have to be fired. It just means that the, the role that they play has might evolve, right. As the organization grows and evolves, um, And uh, I think it's important for people not to be 
you know, too fixated on what do I own? Am I going to own it forever? Am I always going to work for this person? Um, th those are mistakes um, that I think are often made um, and, and uh, understandable because everyone is, you know, very focused on themselves um, oftentimes. Um, so I think establishing a culture that is, is, is sort of acknowledges that people's role and work and responsibility is going to change. And that's a good thing. It means that the organization's evolving in, in important ways. I was actually talking with someone today about, about, you know, scaling, you know, a, you know, a particular function in, in my company and how, you know, there are people who are in certain roles and their roles are going to be diminished because we need to scale because we need to have a multiplier effect. We need to be able to do more with more people, with other types of leaders. And the subdivision of labor actually should be celebrated. It should be celebrated because it means we're scaling. It means what we as a team are going to be able to accomplish more together. Um, so um, that's the other, you know, th that's some of the thinking that I have. And I, I, uh, it's over an overused metaphor, but you know, Operating a business, building and operating a business, it's a team sport. It's very much a team sport. It's not about the star quarterback. It's not about the star running back or whatever metaphor you want to use. It is totally a team sport. Everybody has a role. Everyone has to be celebrated. Um, and, uh, and, and the more that you understand that, um, I think the more effective you can be. Yes, people often say that right, ideas are cheap. It's really all about execution. And really, what's um, what determines success of execution is the people. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so you've shared uh, quite a bit about your conviction and your vision um, for the space and how you started Circle. So looking forward, what do you think? What problems need to be solved to make USDC uh, ubiquitous? And what is next for Circle in DeFi? There are a few things that that were focused on um, that I think are really necessary. And, and the way I think about this is what will it take for something like USDC to be usable by like a billion people and, um, and, and, and to operate, you know, basically at nearly free, you know, to, 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 to transact at scale for, for nearly free. And I think there's a few big things. One is just blockchain infrastructure itself. So there's this sort of arms race or a lot of competition for third generation blockchains. And um, there are many, I think, impressive, you know, technologies that are there. There's projects like Ethereum 2, which, you know, will take another couple of years to mature. And then there are projects in the market today. Um, and, you know, there's different scaling techniques and so on. But fundamentally, right, this needs to be usable at web scale, right? It needs to be usable where you have, you know, an application like USDC um, could, could, could be used by, you know, a billion, you know, different, different users in different ways. So that's one is just scaling. Um, and with scaling, it's also cost efficient scaling, right? To have transaction settlement um, models that are very, very inexpensive. Um, and so, uh, the, again, the, we're seeing really good progress, and I'm confident that over the next, you know, two years or so, that we'll we'll get to that point where you know you could do you could have on-chain infrastructure that are supporting web scale applications, um, and, and USDC would really benefit from that. Um, I think a second problem is really around user experience, and um, you know. The, the, you know, the, I, I mean, we saw this in, in, in the evolution of, of the internet in, in other areas, right? To use email originally, you had to learn how to like configure port settings in a piece of software on your, on your computer and configure your pop mail server and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Which people are like, I, you know, what is that? Um, but, you know, when you could let's use webmail, and someone had built a simple user experience on it, it just made it much more usable for people. And right now, crypto payments are, are too complex. Um, I think for people who are motivated by things like trading and investing or are super motivated by it, like, you know, hashed uh, public keys 
are okay, um, but the user experience needs to improve. And in some ways, like the blockchain transaction layer needs to be a little bit more in the background. So whether that's like leveraging domain name structures or real name structures, um, and actually, you know, very likely seeing companion protocols um, to stable coins that facilitate some of the, what I call the vernacular of payments. I think that things like that will be important for this to be something that would, would replace a lot of existing payment methods. Um, and I think those are very solvable problems as well. Um, some of it is standards work. Some of it is, is user experience work. Um, so I think those are important. And those are not just things for a company like Circle to solve. Those are things that everyone needs to solve. The whole industry has to get behind these things. Um, and then I think the third is, you know, this isn't going to achieve that scale without more regulatory clarity because, you know, a mainstream corporation, you know, Starbucks or whoever, right. They're not going to adopt this as a system to store their money or to, to, uh, to borrow and lend or accept payments. If they don't, if there's not clarity as to what stable coins are and how they fit as a financial market infrastructure in the real economy. So we have to have the regulatory clarity in order for this to, to, to be um, something that, you know, companies all of all sizes feel comfortable with. Um, so again, the people who are crypto native or crypto forward and, and, and have a, a strong incentive to use it, that's one thing. Um, but kind of bringing, you know, crossing the chasm, right? And bringing um, that early majority onto this, it requires more regulatory clarity. So those are things that, that I think are there. And then in terms of like, you know, the, the role in DeFi, I mean, I think, um, you know, we're just kind of along for the ride on, on that, right? There's just so much innovation happening there. And we want to make sure that USDC is usable on all those projects um, and, uh, and, and just continue to support what developers are doing um, and, and find ways to, you know, support those and invest in those and, and, and things like that. And um, so I, I think in, in many ways, what's happening in the broader DeFi ecosystem is something that we can just be, um, you know, kind of an enabler, but not actually, you know, we, you know, we, we, we want to just see the, the, the projects just developing and, and, and growing. And some of the areas I talked about earlier for how market structures could evolve in DeFi, you know, we're following all that really closely and, and hoping to see some of those things come about. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Absolutely. My pleasure.